For centuries, an ancient curse was used to support the terrible evil of slavery. A curse that appears in one isolated verse in the Bible. Even today, this misunderstood curse still lingers with us as a legacy of shame. But fortunately, there are some who through scholarship and honest examination have exposed the lie of a cursed race. And in their pursuit of truth, they have rediscovered a long lost heritage and identity in Africa and in the Bible. The myth of a cursed race, next on Day of Discovery. Hello, my name is Wintley Phipps. Wintley Phipps, a name that identifies who I am. But who am I? I'm a husband, I'm a father, but I'm also a descendant of slaves. Unless you've lived your life with darker skin, you may not appreciate what that question means to people like me. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long way from home a long way from home Sometimes I feel like a motherless child the music and words of the old spirituals reflected both the heartache and the hope of many slaves. Just imagine being captured and treated like animals, being shipped away forever from your family and your home. Imagine being sold like cattle. Imagine losing your language and yes, even your name. Many of African and slave descent have wondered at some point in their lives about their heritage and their identity. They have wondered about who they really are. But for those of us who take the Bible seriously, we know that no matter the race, the color, or ethnicity, we are all God's children. We know that in the eyes of God, we are all equal, and that no one is cursed because of color or race. But through the centuries, the Bible has been used, let's just say in some ways that God never intended. Tragically, some found in its pages a curse, a curse by the prophet Noah that they have said created the black race of Africans, a curse that they claim sentenced an entire race to servitude and slavery. According to professor of history, Dr. Edwin Yamauchi, no other verse in the Bible has been so distorted and so disastrously used down through the centuries for the exploitation of Africans and African Americans as that one obscure verse found in the opening chapters of the Bible in the book of Genesis. If there is one verse in the Bible which has adversely affected Africans, it's the so-called curse of Ham found in Genesis 9, verse 25. There we read, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will be he be to his brothers. This is a curse uttered by Noah. For those of you who are not familiar with the story, Noah became drunk, and then uh, his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, were there at the time, but it was uh, Ham 
who dared to look at Noah's naked body, and then he tried to encourage his brothers to do so, and they would not. They went backwards so as not to look at the sight of their naked father in his disgrace. See, Now, as the text stands, the curse is not upon Ham himself, but upon his son Canaan, who is the eponymous ancestor of the Canaanites, that is, the Canaanites are named after uh, this particular son. According to Dr. Yamauchi, the prophetic curse of Noah was most likely fulfilled on the Canaanites, the pagan descendants of Ham's son named Canaan, who according to the Bible settled in the region of what came to be called the Promised Land, the same descendants who continued in the disrespect and disobedience of their ancestor named Ham. As punishment, God commanded the Hebrews to conquer the Canaanites in order to protect his people from their destructive ways, including the idolatrous worship and child sacrifice. According to the records of history, the Canaanites and their curse have long been extinct. According to the Bible, none of Ham's other three sons were cursed, only Canaan. The descendants of Ham's son, Mitzrayim, settled in Egypt. Ham's son named Put settled near Libya, and his fourth son, Cush, settled in a region south of Egypt, which came to be called by the same name, Cush, as recorded in the Hebrew Bible. Most scholars identify Cush as the area of modern Sudan. The way that name Cush has been translated in English Bibles has created some confusion. German author and scholar Dr. Roland Werner has researched Christian history in Africa. In the Bible we find a, a reference to the country of Cush. We find this in various places in the Old Testament. Genesis 10 in the Table of Nations as one of the neighbors of Mitzrayim. And Mitzrayim of course is Egypt, so Cush must be a neighbor of Egypt. We find the same word, uh, Kush, I mentioned again in Isaiah 18, in Psalm 68, in various other places. And people have wondered what that actually meant. As author and New Testament professor Dr. Alan Callahan observes, the Greeks referred to the people from the region of Kush as Ethiopians. These are the guys to whom um, the Greek writers refer to as Ethiopians and the derivation of that word is in some dispute. Um, most people translate it, that as the people with the burnt faces. But these are, at least as, as Herodotus and people like that, the, the Greek writers knew of these people. They knew of them as um, skilled warriors. You wouldn't want to fight them. Uh, they tended to be tall, dark. Uh, they're beautiful people. And um, the quintessence of civilization. There was a little bit of a confusion because the Septuagint translation, which was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, uh, used the word Ethiopia, Ethiopia, wherever Cush occurred in the Old Testament. So people naturally thought that this referred to the country that we now call Ethiopia. Um, of course, that is not entirely true. Cush is the neighbor of Egypt, which must be Sudan. But how and when did ancient Kush become mislabeled and misinterpreted as a cursed black slave race? According to Dr. Yamauchi, author of Africa and the Bible, the answer is elusive. However, he describes the misuse and misapplication of the curse among all three Middle East religions, the Muslims, the Jewish faith, and Christians. Among the Muslims, one contributing factor seems to be linked to the expansion of Islam after Muhammad's death in 632, which brought Arabs into contact with black Africans many centuries after Noah spoke his prophetic words. Muslims then used this curse, evidently, in a garbled tradition, to say that black Africans were doubly cursed. They were black because of the curse, and they were destined to be slaves because of the curse. Now there are also some Jewish passages in the Talmud 
that have been argued as the basis of uh, as being the basis of this curse. However, the Talmud is a vast, um, incomprehensible work for most non-Jews, and it is hardly likely that this would have become the basis of this famous curse of Ham. Unfortunately, Christians were no better than those of other religious traditions. Carrying the flag and cross of Christ, the Crusaders used war in the name of God. After the Crusades, using the same myth of the curse of Ham, Christian Europeans practiced slavery in the name of God. The curse of Ham also appears among European writers and was strongly used by pro-slave uh, advocates in the United States before the Civil War. African slaves were first offered for sale to the British colony in Virginia in 1619. Then between 1680 and 1700, more than 300,000 African slaves were imported into the British colonies of North America. The earliest use of the curse of Ham to justify slavery in America dates back to the 1670s. But the effect of that teaching is still felt today. The myth of a cursed black slave race came from the misinterpreted and misapplied curse of the prophet Noah. That isolated ancient verse in the book of Genesis became a convenient lie, a rationalization for greed. The truth was, using slaves meant cheap labor. Christians who believed in this curse often ignored the central teaching of the Bible, God's love for the whole world. The Apostle John wrote about God's all-inclusive love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Unfortunately, the effect of that so-called black curse teaching still lingers in the hearts and minds of many. Some have taken a pilgrimage, a journey back before the days of slavery, a journey back to Africa and back into the pages of the Bible. These travelers are part of a study tour. Some look to see themselves in the ancient past and others search for the truth, the truth about who they really are. Well, I wanted to come because the title of the course was The Great Africans of the Bible. And being an African American and just having a strong interest in um, the development of identity and what that has meant for um, my people, really, and also as a Christian, and knowing that Christianity in the past has been used for an evil purpose and enslavement and, you know, really in the history of slavery in America. Uh, what we want to do is um, appreciate all of God's creation. And uh, it's hard to appreciate God's creation if you yourself feel that you are inferior part of God's creation. And so, and so when, when one would feel that they are, um, are very much a part and equal with all other humans that God have created, now we could come together in a, in a sense of unity a lot easier. Because if you feel inferior, you'll be trying to, um, trying to work against, mitigate the whole idea of the inferiority complex. And that would be the driving force of your union as opposed to trying to come together to do something for God. Well, my journey actually began almost a couple of years ago when a staff person of mine announced uh, in a group meeting that blacks were descendants of uh, a curse. So that got me searching, and that's how I started this journey. Um, then I met Dr. Krieger, took a class with her, and she literally opened my eyes to what the Word of God has to say about all people, especially people of color. 
The study tour leader is an enthusiastic professor in her 80s. At first appearance, she's an unlikely source of information about African history, but she's earned the respect of her students. So, after all, he's going to make the gods look like himself. So that's called anthropomorphism. While others her age might be inclined to limit their activities to enjoying their grandchildren and great-grandchildren, Dr. Catherine Crager also pursues another passion. I hoped that if we could bring people face to face with their tradition, if they could actually see uh, representations of ancient people, highly civilized, brilliant people, and how strong their African features were, if they could look face to face at objects of material civilization created by uh, early Africans, that they would understand the importance that the Bible gives to Africans and the importance that is there in a history that has so often been stolen. Many places of historical importance can be discovered along the Nile River. And along the Nile, evidence of the advanced culture of black Africans can be seen in the middle of one of the most important archaeological sites in Egypt, in the city of Thebes. Here at Thebes stand monumental temples, including Egypt's largest temple, the Temple of Karnak. Nearby rises the imposing Temple of Luxor. They display the grand legacy of the Egyptian pharaohs. But located in the temple complex of Karnak rises one giant papyrus-shaped column, one of the last remaining columns erected by a black pharaoh of Egypt, one of the black pharaohs from Kush, who also ruled Egypt, a pharaoh whose name is even recorded in the Bible. His name, Terhaka. Terhaka from the ancient kingdom of Kush. Over 1,000 small statuettes or figurines of Terhaka were found in his tomb. at the back colonnade of the four great colonnades that Tirhaka built. And we're at the base of uh, the columns made distinctively in his style of building. Here is the pharaoh himself. He has a flail in his hand and he is all pharaoh and all power. The pharaoh here has a strong chin. It's a little hard to see because of the false beard. But look at the full lips and look at the molded nose and the angle of the nose. Please notice that some of the other columns lost their tops. Remember, though, that this much nice uh, uh, stone is a big temptation for somebody else to swipe. And they did. The prophet Isaiah described the powerful nation of Cush. Go, swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth, to a people feared far and wide, a powerful and oppressive nation whose land the rivers divide. Ancient historical accounts describe how the bow was a formidable weapon in the hands of these Cushite or Nubian warriors. According to the Bible, the Assyrians under their king Sennacherib had overrun the region and captured Judah's southern fortress, Lachish. Terhaka and his warriors came to the aid of King Hezekiah of Judah. In 2 Kings chapter 19, uh, there is an incidental reference to a king of Egypt was actually from Nubia. Now Sennacherib received a report that Terhaka, the Cushite king of Egypt, was marching out to fight against him. Biblical Terhaka is called Taharka in the Egyptian sources, and he belongs to the 25th dynasty.
I knew that Kush was uh, associated with black people and with Africans, but I did not know that it was mentioned 52 times in the entire mm -hmm. Bible. And that's and she was saying that that's like the more than any other ethnic group, any other nation besides Israel. And I just I love the fact that um, mm -hmm. we're looking into proof and facts, mm -hmm. not stuff that we're making up and saying, you know, mm, yeah. um, this is probably African. We're looking at facts. We're looking at um, facial characteristics. We're looking at everything mm -hmm. here in Africa saying we're not making anything up. We're just showing you church biblical history mm -hmm. um, with African figures. Those who are not African Americans or not blacks will tend to gloss over those legitimate passages where Africans are indeed mentioned. For example, in my opinion, Moses Cushite wife was a black woman from Cush. The, uh, she should not be equated with Zipporah, who was Moses' wife from Midian. Midian is an area of northwestern Arabia. The, uh, also, there are some remarkable Cushites mentioned in Jeremiah, one of whom saved Jeremiah's life. The, and also, the, of course, the eunuch from Ethiopia in Acts 8 who was no doubt black. On the other hand, there are some who are not black, because not all people who lived in Africa were black. Uh, I think uh, a basic principle is that it is not necessary for one to find one's ethnic group mentioned in the Bible in order to accept the biblical message for oneself. For example, there are no Asians mentioned in the Bible. I've sometimes uh, gotten a call from Chinese Christians who wonder if the Magi were Chinese. Uh, no, they're not. Uh, nor are any Native Americans mentioned. It matters not if the pharaoh was black. Uh, that matters not to me. Uh, what matters to me is, uh, is, is that the truth just be, just be brought forth. I think um, especially we as blacks in America with our history of, uh, of slavery and, and our um, church traditions being um, grown and, and the Lord's providential hand upon us in that, in the context of, of you know, uh, history of slavery and segregation and, um, and oppression, and just being raised um, with images of Jesus and, um, as blonde hair and blue eyed, and um, not only Jesus, but church fathers and, um, and biblical heroes in the movies we see and the paintings, and um, you really get um, raised feeling like um, your people didn't have anything to do with this, and it's just amazing Mm -hmm. to see that we did and that God's providential hand has been on black people and on people of African descent, um, not only in our history in America, but all the way back here. It is something that, that everyone needs to understand. Everyone needs to know that even in the Bible, that there is equality. There is no question in my mind that God loves the people of Africa. And as a matter of fact, that uh, he had us in mind from the very beginning, from creation. And, um, you know, he has us in mind all the way through to the vision that I believe John saw in the island of Patmos. While exiled on the island of Patmos, the aging Apostle John received a vision of the future. In that vision recorded in the book of Revelation, the last living apostle saw not a cursed people, but a blessed people. For there, before the throne of God and the Lamb of Christ, were people from every tribe and tongue. John wrote, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And centuries before the Apostle John, the prophet Isaiah looked down the rivers of time to that time of the future kingdom of God. And there in the kingdom, he saw a blessed people, the people of Cush, ancient Nubia, coming to Jerusalem, coming to Mount Zion with gifts. At that time, gifts will be brought to the Lord Almighty from a people tall and smooth skinned whose land is divided by rivers. The gifts will be brought to Mount Zion, the place of the name of the Lord Almighty. So all people everywhere are invited to be a part of God's family and God's kingdom. No one is excluded. No one is left out. No one is cursed because of some shade of color. 
or one's appearance or because they're a man or a woman. For God sees nothing but our hearts. And when our hearts are His, we are all one in Christ. The great apostle to the Gentile nations wrote, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I'm Wintley Phipps. Remember, no matter your color, Jesus loved you all the way to the cross. And he's coming back again for men and women from every race, nation, kindred, tongue, and people.